Most spectators at auto races expect an element of danger. Indeed, for some, the possibility of a crash only feeds their adrenaline fueled excitement for a day at the races. But on occasion, these high speed fender benders can turn deadly, not just for those on the track, but for those watching the action. The speed and ferocity breaking through barriers to drag spectators into a nightmare of twisted steel and flaming fuel. There is perhaps no better example of this than the 1955 Le Mans disaster. Under the glass roof of the Grand Palais at the 1922 Paris Motor Show, three automobile enthusiasts dreamed of creating a racing event that would be the ultimate test of the very best offerings from Europe's car makers. The following year, the first 24 hour of Le Mans race was held in a sleepy hamlet in northwest France. The initial event involved three consecutive 24 hour races with the car that had traveled the furthest across those days being declared the winner. Despite going through a multitude of changes, the race quickly became a worldwide phenomenon, highlighting not only the beauty and power of its vehicles, but also the incredible skill and endurance of the drivers behind the wheel. What was envisioned as a showcase of automotive superiority became a full-blown sport, complete with record-setting speeds, rivalries, and a massive fan following. In 1953, Le Mans and its circuit de la Sarthe was added to the newly formed World Sports Car Championship circuit, ushering in a new era of competition between manufacturers with brands like Ferrari, Aston Martin, and Jaguar sending multiple cars to the event in the hopes of besting their rivals. In 1955, an astounding 60 cars took to the grid, each driven by a team of two racers, many of whom had become household names and racing celebrities. Race day was June the 11th, a sunny Saturday that drew over 200,000 fans to the stands to watch what promised to be the most thrilling rivalry between three top automakers. The reigning champions Ferrari brought five teams to show off its 121 LMs, Jaguar throwing all of their resources toward regaining the crown they had won two years earlier, arrived with a lineup of D-types crafted specifically for the track at Le Mans. And after a two-year absence, Mercedes-Benz had returned with an exciting vehicle, the new 300 SLR with its ultralight magnesium alloy body and air brake. Designed to compensate for its conventional drum brakes, the air brake looked like the rear trunk of the car opening to use an aerodynamic drag effect to break the car quickly. Star drivers Juan Miguel Fangio and Sterling Moss took turns behind the wheel of the number 19 car, and Pierre Levesque drove one of the other two Mercedes on the track. Before race day, Levesque pointed out that the course at Le Mans was too narrow near the pit stop area and the grandstand. It was an observation that, if heeded, could have saved dozens of lives. In truth, the track, now 30 years old, was no longer compatible with the speed of modern vehicles. The 8.38 mile long track was essentially unchanged since its 1923 debut, save for a resurfacing and slight widening following the Second World War. The course was still notoriously fast, 80% of each lap was spent at full throttle. The pit straight was frighteningly narrow and just 12 feet wide. There were no barriers between the pit and the racing lanes, and cars leaving the pit found themselves immediately on a hot track, trying to get up to speed while cars raced by. On the subject of speed, the cars of 1955 were faster than the creators of the Le Mans race could have ever dreamed of. The track had been built for cars with a top speed of 60 miles per hour, but now speeds beyond 170 miles per hour were common. 
Despite this massive increase in pace, drivers at Le Mans still wore no seatbelts, reasoning that it was preferable to be thrown clear of the wreckage in the event of a crash rather than be crushed or trapped in a burning car. One change to this year's event was a new rule allowing for additional pit stops. This led to spectators crowding the area near the pit in an effort to spot their sporting heroes and their exotic machines. The only thing separating them from the track was a four-foot earthen mound. The race began at 4pm with the drivers sprinting across the track to their waiting cars. The first hours of the race were dominated by a fierce competition between Mike Hawthorne driving a Jaguar and Juan Miguel Fangio driving a Mercedes. Pierre Levesque and his racing partner John Fitch had decided on a more conservative approach, saving their top speeds for the second day of the race when they knew other drivers would be getting tired. As the lead cars came around the straight on the 35th lap, Hawthorne easily overtook British driver Lance Macklin, who was driving an Austin Healey. So focused on widening the gap between himself and Fangio, Hawthorne only noticed that his crew was signalling him to come in when he was feet from the pit. He threw up a hand to signal and stomped on the Jags disc brakes, pulling directly in in front of Macklin, who had moved aside to let the Jaguar pass. Macklin's less powerful drum brakes were no match, and he swerved to the left to avoid crashing into Hawthorne. 200 metres behind Macklin, Fangio was closing in on Levesque, aiming to pass the sixth place Mercedes to catch up with Hawthorne. But Levesque, taken by surprise as Macklin swerved across the track, had no time to stop his car, which was travelling at some 120 miles per hour. In a move that Fangio would later claim saved his life, Levesque threw up a hand signal in warning to the car behind him before ploughing into the left rear of Macklin's Austin Healey. The Mercedes front right wheel rode up the back of the car in front of him, launching Levesque's vehicle into the air. Levesque was thrown onto the track, his skull crushed by the high-speed impact. His car collided with an embankment and disintegrated, sending debris, including the engine block, into the crowd, who stood just feet away. The hood of the Mercedes spun through the grandstand, decapitating several people in its path of destruction as the rear of the vehicle burst into flames, spewing white-hot shards of metal into the mass of spectators. Jacques Grelly, who would go on to race at Le Mans himself, was in the stands that day. He would later recount the gruesome scene. He states, He was watching near the pit with a friend who had a pair of binoculars. After the Mercedes came flying directly toward him, Jack pulled himself off the ground to discover he couldn't see out of his left eye. A piece of human brain was covering the lens of his glasses. Next to him, a headless corpse still wore a pair of binoculars around its neck. Grelly, who walked home in shock, was one of the lucky ones in the stands that day. 83 spectators were killed and another 120 suffered injuries. Having ultimately overshot the pit, Hawthorne returned a lap later with tears streaming down his face. Spectators grabbed advertising banners to carry the dead and injured. Priests in the crowd hastily offered last rites and flames from the hot burning magnesium alloy of the Mercedes burned on for hours. Shockingly, the race continued Later, race organisers would say the decision was made to continue the event in an effort to keep spectators engaged and prevent traffic from clogging the roads for emergency vehicles. John Fitch, who had been standing beside Pierre Levesque's wife when the crash occurred, begged Mercedes to withdraw, which it finally did after midnight, putting Fangio from first place. Hawthorne took first place the next day, setting a record average speed of 106 miles per hour. A French magazine ran a photo of the British driver celebrating his victory with the caption, To your health, Mr. Hawthorne. Ultimately, though, the official inquiry did not find Hawthorne to blame, but rather 
the outdated track, just as Pierre Levesque had warned. Following the disaster at Le Mans, several countries banned auto racing, including France, Germany and Switzerland, until spectator safety was improved. Mercedes retiring from the sport for 30 years. Extensive improvements were made to Circuit de la Salle, including redesigning the pit straight to allow for a deceleration lane and limiting the grid to 52 cars. The grandstand was demolished and rebuilt with a wide ditch in front to separate spectators from the racetrack. John Fitch became a lifelong racing safety advocate and developed safety devices still used on highways today, including crash cushions. The 24-hour race at Le Mans still draws significant crowds each year, but the specter of the 1955 disaster still haunts the legacy of the world's oldest endurance auto race. Thank you for watching. And if there's an automotive story you'd like us to talk about, let me know in the comments below.